and welcome to my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show, and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor. This show is pre-recorded. This show is based on Susan B. Anthony, Women's Suffrage, Women's Rights and Abolitionist. Taken from wikipedia.org. Susan B. Anthony, born Susan Anthony, February the 15th, 1820 to March the 13th, 1906, was an American social reformer and women's rights activist who played a pivotal role in the women's suffrage movement. Born into a Quaker family committed to social equality, she collected anti-slavery petitions at the age of 17. In 1856, she became the New York State Agent for the American Anti-Slavery Society. In 1851, she met Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who became her lifelong friend and co-worker in social reform activities, primarily in the field of women's rights. In 1852, they founded the New York Women's State Temperance Society after Anthony was prevented from speaking at a temperance conference because she was female. In 1863, they founded the Women's Loyal National League, which conducted the largest petition drive in United States history. Up to that time, collecting nearly 400,000 signatures in support of the abolition of slavery. In 1866, they, initiate, they initiated the American Equal Rights Association which campaigned for equal rights for both women and African Americans. In 1868, they began publishing a women's rights newspaper called The Revolution. In 1869, they founded the National Women's Suffrage Association as part of a split in the women's movement. In 1890, the split was formally healed when the organization merged with the rival American Women's Suffrage Association to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association with Anthony as its key force. In 1876, Anthony and Stanton began working with Matilda Jocelyn Gage on what eventually grew into the sixth volume, History of Women's Suffrage. The interests of Anthony and Stanton diverged somewhat in later years, but the two remained close friends. In 1872, Anthony was arrested in her hometown of Rochester, New York, for voting in violation of laws that allowed only men to vote. She was convicted in a widely publicized trial. Although she refused to pay the fine, the authorities declined to take further action. In 1878, Anthony and Stanton arranged for Congress to be presented with an, an amendment giving women the right to vote. Introduced by Senator Aaron A. Sargent R-CA, it later became known colloquially as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. It was eventually ratified as the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 1920. Anthony traveled extensively in support of women's suffrage, given as near many as 75 to 100 speeches per year and working on many state campaigns. She worked internationally for women's rights, playing a key role in creating the International Council of Women, which is still active. She also helped to bring about the World's Congress of Representative Women at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. When she first began campaigning for women's rights, Anthony was harshly ridiculed and accused of trying to destroy the institution of marriage. 
Public perception of her changed radically during her lifetime. However, her 80th birthday was celebrated in the White House at the invitation of President William McKin McKinley. She became the first female citizen to be depicted on U.S. coinage when her, portra when her portrait appeared on the 1979 dollar coin. Susan Anthony was born on February the 15th, 1820 to Daniel Anthony and Lucy Reed in Adams, Massachusetts, the second oldest of seven children. She was named for her maternal grandmother, Susanna, and for her father's sister, Susan. In her youth, she and her sisters responded to a great craze for middle initials by adding middle initials to their own names. Anthony adopted B as her middle initial because her namesake aunt Susan had married a man named Burnell. Anthony never used the name Burnell herself and did not like it. Her family shared a passion for social reform. Her brothers Danielle and Merritt moved to Kansas to support the anti-slavery movement there. Merritt fought with John Brown against pro-slavery forces during the bleeding Kansas crisis. Daniel eventually owned a newspaper and became mayor of Leavenworth. Anthony's sister Mary, with whom she shared a home in later years, became a public school principal in Rochester and a women's rights activist. Anthony's father was an abolitionist and a temperance advocate. A Quaker, he had a difficult relationship with his traditionalist congregation, which rebu rebuked him for marrying a non-Quaker and then disowned him for allowing a dark school to operate in his home. He continued to attend Quaker meetings anyway and became even more radical in his beliefs. Anthony's mother was a Methodist and helped raise their children in a more tolerant version of her husband's religious tradition. Their father encouraged them all, girls as well as boys, to be self-supporting, teaching them business principles and giving them responsibilities at an early age. When Anthony was six years old, her family moved to Battenville, New York, where her father managed a large cotton mill. Previously, he had operated his own small cotton factory. When she was 17, Anthony was sent to a Quaker boarding school in Philadelphia, where she unhappily endured its severe atmosphere. She was forced to end her studies after one term because her family was financially ruined during an economic downturn known as the Panic of 1837. They were forced to sell everything they had at an auction, but they were rescued by her maternal uncle, who bought most of their belongings and restored them to the family. To assist her family financially, Anthony left home to teach at a Quaker boarding school. In 1845, the family moved to a farm on the outskirts of Rochester, New York, purchased partly with the inheritance of Anthony's mother. There, they associated with a group of Quaker social reformers who had left their congregation because of the restrictions it placed on reform activities and who in 1848 formed a new organization called the Congregational Friends. The Anthony Farmstead soon became the Sunday afternoon gathering place for local activists, including Frederick Douglass, a former slave, and a prominent abolitionist who became Anthony's long-life friend. As several others in that group were already doing, the Anthony family began to attend services at the First Unitarian Church of Rochester, which was associated with social reform. The Rochester Women's Rights Convention of 1848 was held at that church in 1848, inspired by the Seneca Falls Convention, the first women's rights convention, which was held two weeks earlier in a nearby, nearby town. Anthony's parents and her sister Mary attended the Rochester Convention and signed the Declaration of Sentiments that had been first adopted by the Seneca Falls Convention. Anthony did not take part in either of these conventions because she had moved to Kanajuhari in 1846 to be headmistress of the female department of the Kanajuhari Academy. 
away from Quaker influences for the first time in her life, at the age of 26, she began to replace her plain clothing with more stylish dresses, and she quit using the and other forms of speech traditionally used by Quakers. She was interested in social reform, and she was distressed at being paid much less than men with similar jobs. But she was amused at her father's enthusiasm over the Rochester Women's Rights Convention. She later explained, I wasn't ready to vote, didn't want to vote, but I did want equal pay for equal work. When the Kanajahari Academy closed in 1849, Anthony took over the operation of the family farm in Rochester so her father could devote more time to his insurance business. She worked at this task for a couple of years but found herself increasingly drawn to reform activity. With her parents' support, she was soon far fully engaged in, form, in reform work. For the rest of her life, she lived almost entirely on fees she earned as a speaker. Early social activism. Cautious, careful people, always casting about to preserve their reputation and social standing, never can bring about a reform. Those who are really in, in, in earnest must be willing to be anything or nothing in the world's estimates, estimation and publicly and privately, in season and out, avow their sympathy with despised and persecuted ideas and their advocates and bear the consequences. Anthony embarked on her career of social reform with energy and determination, schooling herself in reform issues. She found herself drawn to the more radical ideas of people like William Lord Garrison, George Thompson, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Soon, she was wearing the controversial bloomer dress, consisting of pantaloons worn under a knee-length dress, although she felt it was more sensible than, than the traditional heavy dresses that dragged the ground. She reluctantly quit wearing it after a year because it gave her opponents the opportunity to focus on her apparel rather than her ideas. In 1851, Anthony was introduced to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who had been one of the organizers, organizers of the Seneca Falls Convention and had introduced a controversial resolution in support of women's suffrage. Anthony and Stanton were introduced by Amelia Bloomer, a feminist and mutual acquaintance who had not signed the Declaration of Sentiments and subsequent resolutions despite her attendance at the Seneca Falls Convention. Anthony and Stanton soon became close friends and co-workers, forming a relationship that was pivotal for them and for the women's movement as a whole. After the Stantons moved from Seneca Falls to New York City in 1861, a room was set aside for Anthony in every house they lived in. One of Stanton's biographers estimated that over her lifetime, Stanton spent more time with Anthony than with any other adult, including her own husband. The two women had complementary skills. Anthony excelled at organizing, while Stanton had an aptitude for intellectual matters and writing. Anthony was dissatisfied with her own writing ability and wrote relatively little for publication. When historians illustrate her thoughts with direct quotes, they usually take them from her speeches, letters, and diary entries. Because Stanton was homebound with seven children, while Anthony was unmarried and free to travel, Anthony assisted Stanton by supervising her children while Stanton wrote. One of Anthony's biographers said, Susan became one of the family and was almost another mother to Mrs. Stanton's children. Biography of Stanton says that during the early years of the relationship, Stanton provided the ideas, rhetoric, and strategy. Anthony delivered the speeches, circulated petitions, and rented the halls. Anthony prodded, and Stanton produced. Stanton's husband said, Susan stirred the puddings, Elizabeth stirred up Susan, and then Susan stirs up the world. Stanton herself said, I forged th the thunderbolts, she fired them. By 1854, Anthony and Stanton had perfected a collaboration that made the New York State Movement the most sophisticated in the country, according to Anne D. Gordon, a professor of women's history.
Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group, educational resources to help reach your goals. Hello, listeners. If you're enjoying the New Heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization, please visit www.newheightseducation.org. And while you're there, check out our online store. Welcome back to the New Heights Show on Education. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm the radio host for this show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil rights. A recap of the first segment of the show on Susan B. Anthony will continue. Temperance was very much a woman's rights issue at that time because of laws that gave husbands complete control of the family and his finances. A woman with a drunken husband had little legal recourse, even if his alcoholism left the family destitute and he was abusive to her and the children. If she obtained a divorce, which was difficult to do, he could easily end up with sole guardianship of the children. While teaching in Kanajahari, Anthony joined the Daughters of Temperance and in 1849 gave her first public speech at one of its meetings. In 1852, she was elected as a delegate to the State Temperance Convention, but the chairman stopped her when she tried to speak, saying that women delegates were were there only to listen and learn. Anthony and some other women immediately walked out and announced a meeting of their own, which created a committee to organize a women's state convention. Largely organized by Anthony, the convention of 500 women met in Rochester in April and created the Women's State Temperance Society with Stanton as president and Anthony as state agent. Anthony and her co-workers collected 28,000 signatures on a petition for a law to prohibit the sale of alcohol in New York State. She organized a hearing on that law before the New York legislature, the first that had been initiated in that state by a group of women. At the organization's convention the following year, however, conservative members attacked Stanton's advocacy of the right of a wife of an alcoholic to obtain a divorce. Stanton was voted out as president, whereupon she and Anthony resigned from the organization. In 1853, Anthony attended the World's Temperance Convention in New York City, which bogged down for three chaotic days in a dispute about whether women would be allowed to speak there. Years later, Anthony observed, no advanced step taken by women has been so bitterly contested speaking in public. For nothing which they have attempted, not even to secure the suffrage, have they been so abused, condemned, and antagonized. After this period, Anthony focused her energy on abolitionist and women's rights activists. When Anthony tried to speak at the New York State Teachers Association meeting in 1853, her attempt sparked a half-hour debate among the men about whether it was proper for women to speak in public. Finally, allowed to continue, Anthony said, Do you not see that so long as society says a woman is incompetent to be a lawyer, minister, or doctor, but has ample ability to be a teacher, that every man of you who chooses this profession tactly acknowledges that he has no more brains than a woman? At the 1857 Teachers' Convention, she introduced a resolution calling for the admission of black people to public schools and colleges, 
but it was rejected as not a proper subject for discussion when she introduced another resolution calling for males and females to be educated together at all levels including colleges it was fiercely opposed and decisively rejected one opponent one opponent called the idea a vast social evil the first step in the school which seeks to abolish marriage and behind this picture i see a monster of social deformity anthony continued to speak at state teachers conventions for several years insisting that women teachers should receive equal pay with men and service officers and committee members within the organization Anthony's work for the women's rights movement began at a time when that movement was already gathering momentum. Stanton had helped organize the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, a local event that was the first women's rights convention. In 1850, the first in a series of national women's rights convention was held in Worcester, Massachusetts. In 1852, Anthony attended her first national women's rights convention which was held in Syracuse, New York, where she served as one of the convention's secretaries. According to Ida Husted Harper, Anthony's authorized biographer, Miss Anthony came away from the Syracuse convention thoroughly convinced that the right was that, that the right which women needed above every other, the one indeed which would secure to her all others was the right of suffrage. Suffrage, however, did not become the main focus of her work for several more years. A major hindrance to the women's movement was the lack of money. Few, men, few women at that time had an independent source of income, and even those with employment generally were required by law to turn over their pay to their husbands. Partly through the efforts of the women's movement, a law had been passed in New York in 1848 that recognized some rights for married women. But that law was limited. In 1853, Anthony worked with William Henry Channing, her activist, Unitarian minister, to organize a convention in Rochester to launch a state campaign for improved property rights for married women, which Anthony would lead. She took a lecture and petition campaign to, into almost every county in New York during the winter of 1855 despite the difficulty of traveling in snowy terrain in horse and buggy days. When she presented the petition to the New York State Senate Judiciary Committee, its members told her that men were actually the oppressed sex because they did such things as giving women the best seats in carriages, noting cases in which the petition had been signed by both husbands and wives instead of the husband signing for both, which was a standard procedure. The committee's official report sarcastically recommended that the petitioners seek a law authorizing the husbands in such marriages to wear petticoats and the wives' trousers. The campaign finally achieved success in 1860 when the legislature passed an improved Married Women's Property Act that gave married women the right to own separate property, enter into contracts, and be the joint guardian of their children. The legislature rolled back much of this law in 1862, however, during a period when the women's movement was largely inactive because of the American Civil War. The women's movement was loosely structured at, the, at that time, with few state organizations and no national organization other than a coordinating committee that arranged annual conventions. Lucy Stone, who did much of the organizational work for the national conventions, encouraged Anthony to take over some of the responsibility for them. Anthony resisted at first, feeling that she was needed more in the field of anti-slavery activities. After organizing a series of anti-slavery meetings in the winter of 1857, Anthony told a friend that the experience of the last winter is worth more to me than all my temperance and women's rights work though the latter were the school necessary to bring me into the anti-slavery work. During a planning session for the 1858 Women's Rights Convention, Stone, who had recently given birth, told Anthony that her new family responsibilities would prevent her from organizing conventions until her children were older. Anthony presided at the 1858 convention 
when the planning committee for national conventions was recognized stanton became its president and anthony its secretary anthony continued to be heavily involved in anti-slavery work at the same time in eighteen thirty seven at age sixteen anthony collected petitions against slavery as part of organized resistance to the newly established gag rule that prohibited anti-slavery petitions in the u.s house of representatives in eighteen fifty one she played a key role in organizing an anti-slavery convention in rochester she was also part of the underground railroad an entry in her diary in eighteen sixty one read fitted out a fugitive slave for canada with the help of harriet tubman in eighteen fifty six anthony agreed to become the new york state agent for the american anti-slavery society with the understanding that she would also continue her advocacy of women's rights anthony organized anti-slavery meetings throughout the state under banners that read no compromise with slaveholders immediate and unconditional emancipation in 1859 john brown was executed for leading a violent raid on the u.s arsenal at harper's ferry in what was intended to be the beginning of an armed slave uprising anthony organized a meeting of mourning and indignation in corinthian hall in rochester on the day he was executed she also presided over the meeting which raised money for brown's family she developed a reputation for fearlessness in facing down attempts to disrupt her meetings but opposition became overwhelming on the eve of the civil war mob action shut down her meetings in every town from buffalo to albany in early eighteen sixty one in rochester the police had to escort anthony and other speakers from the building for their own safety in syracuse according to a local newspaper rotten eggs were thrown benches broken and knives and pistols gleamed in every direction anthony expressed a vision of a radically integrated society that was radical for a time when abolitionists were debating the question of what was to become of the slaves after they were freed and when people like abraham lincoln were calling for african americans to be shipped to newly established colonies in africa in a speech in eighteen sixty one anthony said let us open to the colored man at all our schools let us admit him into all our mechanic shops stores offices and lucrative business avocations let him rent such pew in the church and occupy such seat in the theatre extend to him all the rights of citizenship the relatively small women's rights movement of that time was closely associated with the american anti-slavery society led by william lloyd garrison the women's movement depended heavily on abolitionist resources with its articles published in their newspapers and some of its funding provided by abolitionists there was tension however between leaders of the women's movement and male abolitionists who although supporters of increased women's rights believed that a vigorous campaign for women's rights would interfere with the campaign against slavery in eighteen sixty when anthony sheltered a woman who had fled an abusive husband garrison insisted that the woman give up the child she had brought with her pointing out that the law gave her husbands a complete control of children anthony reminded garrison that he helped slaves escape to canada in violation of the law and said well the law which gives the father ownership of the children is just as wicked and i'll break it just as quickly when stanton introduced a resolution at the national women's rights convention in eighteen sixty favoring more lenient divorce laws leading abolitionist wendell phillips not only opposed it but attempted to have it removed from the record when stanton anthony and others supported a bill before the new york legislature that would permit divorce in cases of desertion or inhumane treatment horace greeley an abolitionist newspaper publisher campaigned against it in the pages of his newspaper garrison phillips and greeley had all provided valuable help to the women's movement in a letter to lucy stone anthony said the men even the best of them seem to think the women's rights question should be waived for the present so let us do our own work and in our own way 
Anthony and Stanton organized the Women's Loyal National League in 1863 to campaign for an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that would abolish slavery. It was the first national women's political organization in the United States. In the largest petition drive in the nation's history up to that time, the League collected nearly 400,000 signatures to abolish slavery, representing approximately one out of every 24 adults in, in the northern states. The petition drive significantly assisted the passage of the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery. Anthony was a chief organizer of this effort, which involved recruiting and coordinating some 2,000 petition collectors. The League provided the women's movement with a vehicle for combining the fight against slavery with the fight for women's rights by reminding the public that petitioning was the only political tool available to women at a time when only men were allowed to vote. With a membership of 5,000, it helped develop a new generation of women leaders, providing experience and recognition for not only Stanton and Anthony, but also newcomers like Anna Dickinson, a gifted teenage orator. The League demonstrated the value of formal structure to a women's movement that had resisted being anything other than loosely organized up to that point. The widespread network of women activists who assisted the League expanded the pool of talent that was available to reform movements, including the women's suffrage movement after the war. This comes to the conclusion of the show. The next show will be the continuation of Susan B. Anthony and the American Equal Rights Association. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email, barbarab at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as I discuss the history of civil rights. Also join Olenian Tabert's pre-recorded radio show, which airs by Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and Pamela Clark's pre-recorded shows, which airs Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Civil rights is our right. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.